You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. Your next stop... ...expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or owners. But they should. Everybody should agree with these uh, statements and beliefs because they're right from the Bible. Friends, welcome to the Word of the Lord. James over here with you. This show is certified organic, pure, unadulterated Word of God. Hope you're ready for a study from God's Word. We are so looking forward to it. I'm glad you're with us, and uh, we want you to know that you will be our uh, welcome guest if you uh, will visit with us at uh, the uh, Boulevard, 250 Boulevard is where we meet, or if you're in Danville, 120 American Legion, 823 Starling Avenue in, in Martinsville, anytime you're uh, associated with the Church of Christ in this area, you'll be so glad to, uh, we'll, to be there. We'll be glad to, to see you and just welcome you uh, with uh, open arms. We'll be glad to uh, study with you or talk with you, visit with you, anything we can do for you. We want to do that very thing. 276-340 is how you can reach me. A word from the Lord at Juma.com is my email address. And so if you uh, want to uh, reach me by any of those means, be glad to hear from you. Uh, free books, DVDs, friends, anything we do is, is always free. A muscle and a shovel, we'll get one of those out to you if we just know where you are. And uh, we hope that you will take advantage of that. Copies of the program uh, are free. And so all that we do, friends, is, is, is for you. It's because we love you so, and I appreciate what, what Caleb had to say, the, the previous uh, uh, lesson, just the, the fact that, you know, love is something that you do, and uh, we're trying to demonstrate our love by what we say and what we do, and that is by giving you the truth. And so we hope that you will uh, come out and study with us. Friends, tonight we want to be asking this question. We're going to ask this question. You know, what, what is it that makes people hold on to their beliefs? even though they hear something contrary in God's Word. Well, what is it that makes them do that? You know, it's, it's always amazing to me that individuals will hear the truth, they'll even recognize the truth, they'll even recognize, yeah, that's right, but yet they just won't move away from it. They won't let it go. And I remember there was a lady, um, she was in the Christian church, and she, she said, well, y'all just need to let go of the, of the piano. You know, she's talking about, we were talking about instrumental music, and she said, y'all just need to let go of the piano. And I said, I said, we're not the ones holding on to it. Y'all are holding on to it. The Bible doesn't talk about it. You're holding on to it. So what is it that makes people hold on to things that, that are not even in the Bible? I mean, just, yeah, my mama did it, my daddy did it, my grandma did it, my grandpa did it, but what is it that's making you hold on to that? Or, or even yet, why is it that people obey the gospel and then fall away? Well, I know that men are drawn away to their own lust, uh, James says, in James chapter 1, and so I know there's, there's the hardships there and the, and the pull of back in the world, but what really is the, the heart of the problem? What really is, when he gets right into it, what is the root of the problem here that we're, we're trying to figure out why people do what they do? Well, what we're going to do tonight, for instance, we're going to look at the Bible, and we're going to find out why people hold on to what they believe, even though it's contrary to the Bible. Or we're going to find out why they do what they do, even though it may not be what God says do. Or even though it may be contrary to God's will. Why is it that they do those things? The Bible will tell us. The Bible's going to give us an answer, and we're going to look at some individuals. And we're going to, use, we're going to have a number of points here, and they're all going to be from the book of Acts. So if you have your Bibles, open up your Bibles, <clears throat> turn and follow with me in the book of Acts. We're going to uh, be looking there. But the first person or the first um, uh, uh, example we want to look at is we want to look at uh, Acts chapter 6 and verse 7. We're going to look at the synagogue goers. We're going to look at some folks that were, that were uh, known. I, you might, they were religious, very religious people. Uh, they uh, uh, attended the synagogue, you might say. And yet here they were listening to a sermon, and yet they had problems with it. Now, I want you to notice, let's just start in Acts chapter 6. Uh, and verse uh, 8, Acts chapter 6 and verse 8 is where we want to begin. Now, this is what the Bible says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and uh, Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and them of Cilicia, uh, and of Asia. And notice what they were doing, disputing, disputing with Stephen. 
Verse 10, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men which said, we have heard him speak uh, blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set, him up, set up false witnesses which said, this man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against his holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy the place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Now, let's stop there for a moment. Here's some individuals. They did not like to hear what Stephen was preaching. Now, the audience, they just couldn't answer. They just could not answer. The Bible says there in verse uh, 10, verse 10, that they, that they could not resist the wisdom and the spirit of which he spake. Why? Because it was the Holy Spirit. He was speaking by the Holy Spirit. He was guided by the Holy Spirit to say these words, to give an answer, just as Jesus said, uh, the Holy Spirit would do in Acts chapter and Matthew chapter 10. And so here they are. They're not able to answer. And so they stirred up the people. They told lies about him. They said that he's speaking blasphemous words and, and so forth. They're making up all kinds of lies. Now, eventually, you know what happens if you, if you read Acts chapter 7, uh, when Stephen gives his defense, eventually they actually wind up killing him. And they laid their, their garments, their, their clothes at the, at the feet of a man named Saul, a young man named Saul who led us were going to become the Apostle Paul. Now, why, why is it that people would get so mad about hearing something? You know, I mean, why can't it just be, you know, well, that's your sure belief, and you just go along, get, I mean, man, can you imagine these folks would be very politically incorrect. I mean, they are just not wanting to hear anything that's opposed what they believe. You know what, that's, that's, the, way, that's the way it is today. People get mad when they hear the truth. They get mad when they hear the truth. You tell them something, here's from the Bible, you read from the Bible, and boy, they get red hopping mad. Now, why is it that some people get mad about something? Now, you don't believe me. You don't believe me that people get mad. I just want you to listen to these individuals. Here's a good example of how people react when they hear the truth. These are people that have called into our program or they're talking about us and so forth. Just listen to how how livid they are, you might say, about the truth. And, and uh, so I'm going to say, you know, why is, it, why is it that these people are this way? Here's a good example of what we're talking about. Now, what you're doing is segregating. You're saying, yada, 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 this, this is my religion is the only one right. That's not right. When we get to heaven, it's going to be all types of religion. Ma'am, have you been watching our program all night? Yeah, I have, and getting mad at the minute. Well, let me ask you this. Are you, can I ask you, and you be honest with me, are you a Baptist? Absolutely, I'm a Baptist. All right, now now watch what I'm going to do, ma'am. I'm, I'm trying to be kind. I just want us to reason together, okay? I don't want you to be mad at me. I just want us to reason, okay? I don't want to reason. I just want you to answer well, my question. you're right. You don't want to reason. All right, my, my answer to your question is... If you're a Baptist, then you recognize that there's nowhere in the Bible that it says not to sprinkle. But would you affirm that sprinkling is okay? No, but... Wait, 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 ma'am. You just killed yourself right there. Oh, shut up. Have somebody telling you it's a tenth? No, but nobody. I give more than a tenth. Okay, well, fine. Now, it's your turn to answer our question. Are you in a Baptist church? I'm in a Baptist church, that's and what you I and thought. your fat boy are both on your way to hell. That's where y'all live. Take me in two sentences and then ask your question. All right. That thing sitting beside of you ain't nothing but a crit. He's going to bust her wide open. Mm. I, don't, I don't have a church. Well, that's why you're going to hell, brother. I'm in the Lord's church. What church you're are you in? You're a fake dude, and I, you're going to be canceled. You ain't about nothing. What, what church are you in? I'm in a, I'm in a brethren church. All right, show it in the Bible. Here, I don't gotta show it in the Bible. How do you feel inside about Johnny Robinson? I despise him. Look here. But you know what I think? Is this scripture? Is this scripture? Yeah, well, all you like is a horn. Do you believe in judging? I don't judge you. Well, I you hate just, you. You just <laughs> hates me. Did you say? Would you say that again? I said I hate you. Thank you. If I ever catch one of my kids in your church, 
I'll stomp a mud hole in them so deep, they'll never be able to get up and walk out. And you are a money-grubbing, lying hypocrite. How do you think? Tell me why she get on there and, and uh, he get on there and he's got an attitude problem. You know, uh, a preacher don't have an attitude problem like that thing guy. I mean, I'm sound and all. I mean, he, I mean, I done got hot with him, you mm -hmm. know. Johnny Robert, that man, is, if the blind is leading the blind, his 75 is going to fall in hell with him. Smugly, Has anybody in your rotten church ever matched Mother Teresa? You call him a coward, but you're being a coward. If I could meet him face to face, I'd show him what a coward was. What'd you do to him? I'd beat his head in. Yeah, you both look like a bunch of... All right, I had to beep that one. That, that's the that's the foul mouth guy, potty mouth, that calls in every once in a while. I think that may be the same person that called in uh, a couple weeks ago and and uh, dropped the f bomb on on Caleb. You see, but now why is it people get so mad about this? Even to the point that I mean, they've even threatened. I mean, I think Caleb got trapped in last Wednesday night. Uh, uh, individuals uh, threatening him, wanting to fight, and people saying they're going to shoot people. And I remember one time Jason Harrison guy called in and said he'd put slugs in Jason's chest and I mean, wh what is up with all that? Why, why do people get so mad? I mean, why is it that individuals hate to hear the truth so much? I'll tell you what the problem is, friend. And I, I'm, I'm going to tell you, we get down to the, the heart of the problem. The heart of the problem that all these people have, it's a problem of the heart. It's a heart problem. See, when it gets right down to it, friends, any time you're hearing the truth, if your heart's not right, it's not going to receive this word. Now, God's people, God has always told people, his people and Jews and Gentiles alike, that they need to work on their heart. I mean, there's always been a constant uh, uh, reminder or an admonition to, to take care of the heart, take care of the heart. Now, notice this. In Acts 7, verse 51, Acts 7 and verse 51, we actually find uh, the problem here. In Acts chapter 7, let's get up here, Acts 7 verse uh, 51. Now here's Stephen. This is the, coming down to the end of Stephen's sermon. He says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers uh, persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye uh, have now been the betrayers, the betrayers and murderers, verse uh, 53, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Now he just laid it out flat to them. You have a heart problem. You have a heart problem. Now, the reason why individuals get mad is because they are uncircumcised of heart. See, nothing, just, nothing is going to get into their heart because they won't let the truth in. Now, this is something that, that God has talked about all this time. See, when you go looking at the Old Testament, this is not what Stephen says to them about uncircumcised heart. That's not just some newfangled word. Look at this. In Deuteronomy 10 and verse 16, Deuteronomy 10 and verse 16, here's the picture that God gives to his people. He says, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. Now what's God talking about here? He's talking to Jews and they had the covenant of circumcision of the flesh. Abraham uh, received the covenant of the circumcision of the flesh. That is every male child was circumcised on the eighth day. But God is talking to them. He's trying to get them to realize the most important circumcision is the circumcision of the heart. He says, if you are circumcised of the heart, then you won't be stiff-necked. You won't be stubborn. But that's the problem. People have a heart problem. They're uncircumcised of the heart. And so these people that are hearing the truth, oh, boy, they're mad. They're red, scalding, hot, and mad. That's what the, that's what the man said. I'm all hot, boy. I'm, I'm all hot. I'm getting all fired up and hot about it. <clears throat> that lady called in and said, she said, well, I'm getting mad about a minute. Well, why are you getting so mad? You know why? It's because it's working on your heart. It's working on your heart. Look again at Jeremiah, Jeremiah 4 and verse 4. Jeremiah 4 and verse 4. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskin of your heart. 
ye men of Judah, inhabit, inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth <clears throat> like fire and burn that none can quench it because the evil of your doings. See, when you've got an uncircumcised heart, you aren't going to do what God says. You're going to be stiff-necked. You're going to be rebellious. Let's look at one more. Jeremiah 9, 26. Jeremiah 9, 26. Egypt and Judah and Edom and the children of Ammon and Moab and all they that are in the uttermost corners that dwell in the wilderness. Now watch what he says. For all these nations... My Bible program just frees up on me. Oh, for all the, for all these nations are uncircumcised. That's, that's the last verse. For all these nations are uncircumcised, and the house of Israel are uncircumcised in the heart. Now that's that's the problem. See, they're they're rebelling against God. They're uncircumcised in the heart. Now, friends, when you're talking about why do people get mad, it's because they're uncircumcised in the heart. If your heart is not circumcised, that means it's not humbled. You are not willing to humble yourself. Listen, Leviticus 26 and verse 41. Leviticus 26 and verse 41. One more here. He says, and that I have also walked contrary unto them and have brought them unto the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled. If their uncircumcised hearts be humbled and they accept the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham and I will remember and I will remember the land uncircumcised, they won't humble themselves. Now, friends, when I hear people get mad about the truth and I hear Stephen say, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart and ears, that means you aren't letting the truth get into your heart. You're not willing to humble yourself. You're not going to humble yourself down and listen to what God says. Now, you can say all you want to, I love God, I love God, I love God. But the bottom line is, you are stiff-necked and uncircumcised. Now, the heart of the problem is a problem of the heart. Not being circumcised. Not being, not being willing to let the truth get in. Now, is that where you are? So I think there's a lot of folks, I think there's a lot of folks that what they do is they, they look at the heart or they look at, uh, at, at the truth and they don't realize, but your heart is hardened. When people call in and tell us they're not going to do what the Bible says, when it's right on the screen, put it right on the screen, and they won't read it, they're going to fight against it, tell us that we're lying, and tell us we're leading people astray when what we're giving them is the Bible. Friends, that's a heart problem with them. That's why those people call in and curse. That's why those people call in and, and get mad and, and uh, scream and shout and hang up and things like that because the truth is hitting home. The truth is hitting home. Now, there's one example. Those folks that went to the synagogues, they heard, they heard pure, unadulterated truth, and yet they wouldn't accept it. Why? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem of the heart. It's a heart problem. It's a heart problem. You want to work, my Lord? Uh, hi, James. Uh, listen, I, I, I'm so humbled my, that I wasn't hardened I didn't have a hardened heart. I've always been humble. But I, I just had a conversation today with the preacher's daughter, and she's related to my cousin. She's married to my cousin. And I told her that I needed to get rebaptized. And she said, why do you need to get rebaptized? One drop of blood from Jesus saved you, saved you from everything. And then my sister-in-law spoke up. Uh, they were here. Uh, I had a funeral in the family today, so a lot of us gathered. And I, I, they treat me like I'm. I do go to a counselor, but they treat me like I don't know anything in the heart. 
whole wide world, I humble myself so badly that I I just stay alone all the time. Right. Well, that's the way people are when, when you're trying to do what's right. There's always going to be individuals that are trying to hold you back. So what you need to do is you need to go ahead and just obey obey the Lord and not worry about them. You know what I'm saying? Because they're the ones that they're the ones that are not going to humble themselves. So you can you can humble yourself and do what God says, regardless of what they say. And that's what I'd encourage you to do. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye bye. All right. Okay. Yeah. Humble yourself. Go ahead and submit to God's will. All right. So the synagogue goers. These are church going folks. People. These people went to church. They read, they read Moses every Sabbath day. But you know what? They didn't want to hear the truth. Now, is that where you are? Is that where you are? Now, what about this? Here's another group of people. These are, these are the spouses. These are two people in Acts chapter 5. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of an amazing scenario you have here. You have the, the early church was thriving. They had Pentecost. 3,000 souls was, uh, were saved. Added to the church daily such as should be saved. Acts 2 verse 47. I mean, everything is going well. You have Acts chapter <clears throat> 4. Uh, they're all with uh, one heart. They're all unified. Uh, Acts 4 and uh, verse, uh, notice verse 2. Uh, I'm sorry, there were, there were some, pers- or some troubling, troubles from the outside. People were troubled that they preached Jesus. Uh, Verse 4, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men were about 5,000. All right, so great numbers of people were obeying the gospel. Great numbers of people were, were obeying the gospel. Let's come down to verse 32. Notice how things are, how things are going. And the multitude of them which believed were about were of one heart and of one soul. Neither, neither said any of them that had, that had, neither of them that ought, of the things, neither of them said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. All right, verse 33. And with great power I gave the apostles witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, <coughs> for as many as had possessions of lands and houses sold them and brought the price of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and distribution was made to every man according as he had need. Now notice this, verse 36. And Joseph, who uh, the apostles uh, were was surnamed, by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of uh, consolation, a Levi in the, of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. All right, everything is going well, real well. But now you have a group of people, two people, a couple of people named Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias, with his wife, fired his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price. And his wife, being privy to it, verse 2, wife being privy to it, they brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. All right, now what, what has happened here? Let's, let's go back, let's look here. All right, so now you've got, uh, you've got Ananias and Sapphira coming in, and they sell a portion of land, and they bring it and lay the price at the apostles' feet. Now, the Bible says they embezzled it. They embezzled it. Let's get that verse here. They embezzled it. Uh, They kept back part of the price. That word, those two words, kept back, means embezzled. What they did was they sold it, and they wanted everybody to think that they had given the whole price of the land. Now, there wasn't a problem with giving a part of the price of the land. You know, wasn't a problem with selling the property and then say, you know what, we're going to give this to the, give this to the church so that everything can, can uh, uh, people can be helped who are in need or whatever. There wasn't a problem with that. But the problem was they made out as if they had given it all. They kept back part of the price. Let's say they sold it for... I don't know. I'm just using a number here. They sold it for thirty thousand dollars, and they gave twenty thousand. They said, "You know what? We, we we sold this land, and, and here's all of it." Well, it wasn't all of it. That was only a part of it, only two thirds of it. And there wasn't a problem with the only giving two thirds of it. The problem was they're making out as if they had given it all. Now, what caused individuals to do this? What would what would cause individuals to to keep back part of the price and lie? Look at this. 
Look what, look what uh, Peter says. Uh, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and keep back part of the price of the land? Was it remained? Uh, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast lied, not lied unto men, but unto God. You lied to God. You lied to the Holy Spirit. Why are you lying about this? What caused people to lie about it? Well, you know what caused them to be deceitful? It's a heart problem. It gets back to that heart. It gets back to that center of reasoning, that, that center of intellect. And so that is the problem. The problem of the heart is the heart of the problem. They wanted to be seen of men. They wanted individuals to look at them and say, boy, look what they did. You know what I say they did? Uh, I say they're trying to keep up with the Joneses. Actually, keeping up with the Josephses. You remember that? Because back in chapter 4, Joseph bought a piece of land, and he sold it, and he gave it to the apostles, and distribution was made. Well, here comes Ananias and Fire. They're going to do the same thing. They're trying to keep up with the Josephs. They're trying to keep up with the Joneses. Isn't that what people do today? They try to keep up with the Joneses by doing what everybody else has. You know, Wayland Jennings, he's saying, you know, got a four, we've been busy keeping up with the Jones. Four-car garage and still building on. Here's what they're doing. They want to be seen of men. Look what we have done. Look what we have done. Well, you know what Jesus has to say about that? He says in Matthew chapter 6, he says, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Don't do that. Don't do that, he says. He says, therefore, when thou doest thine alms, that your good deeds, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may, uh, that they may be, uh, have the glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. What makes people want to do things just to be seen of men? You know what it is, friends? It's a problem of the heart. It's a heart problem. Individuals who do what they do just to just to so, say so people can say, look what they're doing. That's their reward. That's a heart problem. I th I see that, friends. You see it. I, I've been to I've been to some of your assemblies. I think sometimes folks just get dressed up to see if they can outdress somebody. Uh oh, stepped on some toes there. That's right. Somebody's getting mad. Don't be mad. That's a heart problem too. You know that's right. Somebody said, I'm going to drive a nicer car because my neighbor's got a nice car. I'm going to get a nicer car. Oh, he got a, he got a 2015. I'm going to get a 2016. Oh, he's driving a Mercedes. I'm going to get a Rolls. He's driving a Rolls. I'm going to get a Bentley. That's what these preachers do. I, I, I'm convinced that what they do, they're trying to outdo everybody else. They're trying to get more prestige and honor and glory of men and not realizing that the problem is, it's a problem of the heart. Friends, why don't you just do something not to be seen of men, but just to do the right thing? See that? That's a heart problem. Now, that's the problem we're facing. That's the problem we're dealing with here. Now, I want you to think about this, friends. We've talked about the, the synagogue people and, the, and the, the spouses here. They've all had a heart problem. They, every, every problem they have is a problem of the heart. But let's look at one more here. Here's the sorcerer. Here's the sorcerer. In Acts chapter 8, in Acts chapter 8, we meet a man in Samaria, and his name Simon. Now Philip went down to Samaria, and he preached Christ unto them. And the people were one accord, gave heed unto the things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the things, uh, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits... Uh, crying out with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. Verse 8, And there was great joy in that city, but there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that for a long time he bewitched the people, he bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip, 
preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. They, they left Philip behind. I mean, Simon behind. They said, we, we, we realize what the, what the real power is. So here's a man. Here's a man who uh, hears, the, hears the truth. Here's the preaching. And he sees what Philip's doing, the miracles that he's doing. And, and he's hearing the sermons. He's hearing, seeing the miracles and wonders that he's doing. And he says, you know what? This guy's the real deal. I'm a fake. This guy's a real deal. I, I'm a charlatan. This guy's a real deal. I know this man really had the power of God. I'd have been putting myself off as someone that had the power of God. And so what happens? Everybody leaves Simon. They stop following Simon, and they start uh, listening to Philip. Now, so when, when Simon sees the real power, he wants some of this. Now, look what he does. Look what he does. Verse 13 says, And Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. <clears throat> now, remember where Philip is. I mean, Simon is. Simon's a man, he was, he was up here pretty high, good standing with all the people, high standing with all the people. They held him in high regard. This man's the, this power, this man's the power of God. Well, when he sees the real deal, though, he knows that Philip is someone that he needs to get close to. Why? Well, because Philip's kind of taking the spotlight away from him. So he obeys the gospel. He obeys the gospel. Now look what happens. Peter and John come down. Peter and John come down from Jerusalem to Samaria. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that, in whomsoever, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Now, look what he's doing here. He sees Philip doing these miracles and wonders that he can't do. He can't even touch it. And he sees, so he's, he's following Philip around. Well, Philip doesn't do anything to anybody other than just heal him or do a miracle. But now Peter and John come down and all of a sudden they impart the ability to do what Philip's doing. In other words, Philip had to have his hand, had apostles' hands laid upon him in order to receive this gift. So now Simon is putting two and two together. And he said, you know what? Philip's doing these things and he's kind of come out and out shouting me. I realize now that Philip must have had hands laid on him by the apostles in order to do these things. So what I need to do is I need to get this power too. But watch it. He doesn't just want the power. He doesn't just want the ability to do miracles. Look what he says. Look again. He says, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. He didn't even have the power Philip had. Not only did he want to be in Philip's shoes, he wanted to be better than Philip. He wanted to do greater things than Philip. He wanted to be the person that says, I'm going to give it to you or I'm not going to give it to you. Now, why would a person ask this? Why would a person want to do such a thing? Why would he say, hey, Give me this power so that I can lay hands on people. Why, why would he do that? You know what it gets down to? It gets down to a, the similar problem that we've been talking to all this time. It's the, same, it's the same problem, I submit to you, that these people have. Now, listen. What Simon had is, is, is a similar problem to what this man has. Listen to this. Jackie Poe. They've got that same power to preach Jesus. And when that takes place, <laughs> when we get all these elders and encouragers out there doing their ministry, oh, help me, God. Doing the ministry they're called to do. And by the way, and I said this at the very beginning, this family care ministry is of God. If we've ever done anything of God, this family care ministry is of God. Because our purpose is to, is, to, is to love you, to take care of you, to let God's eyes lie as lies. 
That hasn't changed. Folks, it just hasn't changed. God's standard has not changed. People can say, well, we need to throw the Bible away all they want to, and they can say we need to change the Constitution all they want to, but it's not going to change. You can't change God's Word, and, and you can't change the Constitution because it's based on God's Word. All right, he said he had the power. I, I, that wasn't the, the, actually the whole clip I wanted. But he said they had the power. He's going to go out and he's going to lay hands on people and they're going to heal the sick and they're going to cause the lame to walk and the blind to see and, you know, I guess they're going to raise the dead. I know he said they're not going to handle any snakes in there, but uh, I guess he's scared of snakes. <clears throat> Doesn't believe that part, but nonetheless, he's got the power. Now, why would someone claim to have that power? Why would someone claim to be able to give something to somebody that obviously he can't do? Because one of the ladies in there, you noticed, she was signing to the deaf people. Now, why did he just go heal that deaf person if he has the power? Friends, here's what I'm talking about. The same problem that Simon the sorcerer had, making himself to be someone, and then wanting the power so that he can lay hands and give miraculous gifts to someone, is the same problem that's being exhibited with guys like Jackie Poe. When they say, well, we got the power, we can heal, we can heal. That sounds more to me, that sounds more to me like Acts chapter 8 and verse uh, 9 and 10. He bewitching the people, giving out that he himself was some great one. And let everybody go, oh, this is the great power of God. You don't think it's the same problem? It is. Same problem. Same source of problem. And it's the same reason why preachers who so-called preach the gospel, they use the gospel to bewitch the people and trick people. Just like this. Just like this. The greatest thing you can do for your finances is give to the work of God. On TV and at his crusades, Hinn promises that not only will God improve your health, but your financial life as well, perhaps by getting you out of debt with an unexpected financial windfall. But first, you have to give money to his ministry. Hinn calls it sowing the seed. So expect a financial harvest, but you've got to sow a seed to see it happen. You may want to call your seed in today. The 800th number is on the screen. So Hin follower Carlotta Moore told us she sows a seed of $12,000 a year with Pastor Benny and that she fully expects to be financially rewarded. The Bible says what you sow, you're going to reap. Now, if you sow good things, you're going to reap good. But might that mean that if you give money, you get money back? Oh, yeah, you will get money back. You will get money back. Out of the clear blue sky, checks will come from somewhere. You go put on a dress or something or take out a pocketbook up there in the closet. There's 50 or $60 laying up in there. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Thank you, Lord. You understand? And the money Benny Hinn's ministry gets is not only in the form of donations. He sells his books. He sells his tapes. He sells his uh, everything. And, 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 it, and it's just a money machine. And money pours in. He's one of the most successful money raisers in history. In recent years, the Hen Ministry's total annual income has increased dramatically, from $50 million in 1997 to the latest estimates that the ministry says are inaccurate of more than $100 million a year. $100 million a year. How does he do that? He's bewitching the people. Why does he do it? Why does he do it? Same reason why Simon the Sorcerer wanted the ability to lay hands on people and give them miraculous gifts. The same reason why he was bewitching the people to start with. Because it was a way to make people think he's some great one. That he is the great power of God. That's what these guys are doing. That's what Jackie Poe's doing. That's what Benny Hinn's doing. That's what Lawrence G. Campbell. That's what all these guys that claim to be uh, faith healers in this area and out outside this area. That's what they're doing. They're bewitching people, getting them to think that what there's some, there's some power of God. Now, why do they do that? Why would this man want you to think that he's the great power of God? You know what it is? It comes down to that same thing. It's a problem of their heart. It's a heart problem. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. They don't really love people. 
they don't really love the truth and they don't really love uh, the people that they're ministering to. They want money. They want power. They want preeminence. That's what they want. They want to be known as the chief apostle of the world. They want to be known as the some uh, great power of God, a spokesman for God, a prophet of God. They want to be known as someone. It's the same problem that, that Simon had. And Simon, if you recall, we go back to our text here. When Simon said that, look what Peter said to him. Simon, uh, Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. You know what the problem is? It's the problem with the heart. When people trick other people in order to get those people, the masses, to think that they're some great person, when they say, oh, yeah, we can heal. Yeah, we can do miracles. Yeah, we can, we can uh, lay hands on the sick and we can, we can bring about friends. That's, that's, all, that's all under the, the name of, uh, of, of tricking people, duping people, making out that they are some great one. Friends, that's, that's a problem of the heart. They have, they have a, a desire. They have a desire not for the cares or concern of people, but really for more for money. Look at this. Here's a uh, something about the where Benny's heart is, Benny Hen's heart. Heavenly inspired vision. And then there was Pastor Benny's most ambitious project, his twenty-five million dollar healing center to be built in Texas. And the Lord said to me to build a healing center that people can come to twenty-four hours a day, any day of the week, and be prayed for and get healed. That was Benny Hinn raising funds for the project in 1999. But this was Benny Hinn on a Christian telethon a year later. Many of our wonderful friends have called and said, "What's with the healing center?" And basically what the Lord has said to me is to wait for his voice. Hinn announced that God had told him to postpone construction. So he said he was going to spend that money on other things. I'm putting all the money we have in the ministry to get out there and preach. All right. So God told me to raise all this money for a healing center. And then God told me once all the money was in, and everybody's asking about the healing center. Well, God told me that I should wait until I, he, until I hear from him again. And what did God tell him to do with this, with this money? Put it back in the ministry. Friends, it's a heart problem. Look what Paul says in 1, Peter, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 5. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt mind. Destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. See, friends, it's a heart problem. It's always connected to the heart. Men of corrupt minds. Look what Paul's going to say in First Peter, or First Tim, First Timothy. Paul is writing in Timothy, not Peter. First Timothy, chapter six, and look at this. He says, "For the." Uh, Verse 9, 1 Timothy 6, 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. There's the will. They will be rich. Their desire. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. These are what you should run from. But these guys have a heart problem. Their heart is somewhere else. It's not on, it's not on the truth. It's not on the things of God. It's on the things of men. You know what Jesus told Peter? Remember what Jesus told Peter in Matthew 16? Matthew 16 and verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show to the disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and of the chief priests 
and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day? And Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. And he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those things that be of men. Friends, there's no way you can tell me that guys like Benny Hinn, Jackie Poe, and all these guys that are duping people, making them think that they have these miraculous powers, you can't tell me they have men's best interest at heart. The problem is they have a heart problem. They want to be seen of men. They want to receive the things of this life. They think that, that gain is godliness. And that if you're, if you're doing God's will, you're going to be rolling in the dough. And I'll just dupe the people and, and God's blessing me by all these silly people that I'm tricking. No, friends, that's not, that's not what the Bible's saying. It's a heart problem. It's a heart problem. Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Here's what Peter says. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable, heresy, damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness, covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, their damnation and their damnation slumbereth not. Making merchandise, the love of money, feigned words. That's what we're talking about, friends. The problem that these guys have, it's a heart problem. It's a heart problem. Their desire to be seen, their desire to be elevated in the eyes of men, their desire to make themselves something that they're not. Friends, Paul said, if a man think himself something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. And that's exactly what what people do. And people who follow these individuals, they are being led down a down a, a, the wide and beautiful path that will only lead to destruction. It's a hard problem. Same, the same problem that the people had who heard Stephen preaching and, re, and rebelled at his preaching, the same problem that Ananias and Sapphira had when they embezzled money, the same problem that Jackie Poe and all these false teachers have when they make themselves something, the same problem that Simon had. It's all a heart problem. It's all a problem of the heart. They just don't want to do what God says. Now, friends, when we're talking about all these problems, it all comes from an evil heart of unbelief. Look at this in Hebrews 3, verse 7. Hebrews 3, verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if you will hear, my, hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. Uh, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years, therefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter to my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. An evil heart of unbelief. Now you may say, well, I believe, in, I believe in God, James. James, I believe, I believe, I believe. Well, if you believe, you'll obey. See, it's one thing to say you believe, but faith without works is dead. James chapter 2. So if you, if you say you believe, then do it. Otherwise, your heart is evil. It's an evil heart of unbelief. And that is the root of all problems that will always result in being lost, my friend. It's evil heart. It's an evil heart. It's a heart problem. It's a heart problem. Now, you might say, well, I don't think I have a heart problem. I, I don't think I have a heart problem. Well, let's just look at one more then while we have the time. Got a few minutes left. You may think that you don't have an evil heart of unbelief because, you know, you're a good person. You know, I'm, I'm a good person. I don't, I don't do all these bad things. I go to church on Sunday and, you know, I love God. I, I treat my neighbor right and, you know, I don't <clears throat> drink, smoke, dip or chew and I don't date the girls that do and, and it's like, I, I do all these things. I do good stuff. 
But friends, if you don't do what God says, you have a heart problem. You may not scream and shout and fight and stomp and cuss. You may not do all that when it comes to hearing the truth. But I know there's some of you out there who watch this program, and you watch it regularly. Dare I say, faithfully. But the problem is, you hear the truth, you say, yeah, that's right. But I'm just not going to obey the gospel. Let me give you one more. In Acts chapter 28, Acts chapter 28, the last chapter in the, in the book, of, a book of Acts, Acts 28, verse 23, there are some folks that come to talk to Paul. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many unto him, into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and of the prophets, from morning till evening. Now notice this. When some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto you our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and should hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Now what was Paul doing? Paul was talking to some people about the church. He was talking to them about the church, the church of Christ, the kingdom of God. That's what he was talking about. The kingdom and the church, one and the same. And he was talking to them about the kingdom. He was talking to them about the church. Some believed it and some didn't. And they went away. Those people who heard what he said, they did not want to receive it. And Paul said the reason why is because they had a heart problem. He said they have a heart problem. They don't want to see it. They don't want to hear it. Oh, they heard it. But they don't want to hear it. They saw it. They don't want to admit it because they know that if they, if they accept it, they're going to have to be converted. They're going to have to convert. They're going to have to change. So what do they do? They harden their heart. They had a heart problem. Now, friends, you may be sitting there tonight, and you're saying, you're sitting on your couch, you're there in your recliner, and you're going, I've heard James and Johnny and Micah and Caleb and Mark, and I've heard all these guys talk about the Church of Christ. And I've heard them talk about what I must do to be saved. I've heard them say that, yeah, we must, I must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I must repent of my sins. Acts 17, verse 31. I've heard them say that, yeah, you have to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Acts 8, verse 36 and 37. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 9 and 10. And I've heard them say that you have to be baptized for the remission of sins, which is what the Bible says. Acts 2, verse 38. Acts 22, 16. 1 Peter 3, 21. I've heard them say all these things. And I've heard him say that if I do that, then God will add me to the church. Man won't vote on me. God will add him to the church. I've heard the Bible say all these things from the mouth of all of these preachers. And yet I'm still not going to do it. You're going to sit there and you're going to harden your heart, friends. You're going to harden your heart because you don't really want to do it. Now, the question is, what will you do with it? What will you do with it? Are you going to be like these folks in, in Acts 28? And you're going to turn your heart, harden, let it harden, turn aside from it, don't want to believe it, don't want to accept it, even though, even though we're reasoning out of the Scriptures, just like Paul did. We're reasoning out of the Scriptures about Jesus, about the church, about the things that a person must do to be saved. Now notice this. 
you hear us give you a Bible verse every time. Somebody calls us up, what do you think about this? Well, here's what the Bible says. You call in and ask us a question, we give you a word from the Lord. And yet, you're still out there. Well, I think one church is just as good as another. Friends, we've been offering $1,000 to find another kind of church in the Bible. It's not in there, but yet you're going to stay in it. Why? You've got a heart problem. You've got a heart problem. We hear people say all the time, well, I, I've, I've been baptized. I said my little prayer, and then three days later, three months later, six weeks later, we had a big baptism down at the river. That's not what the Bible says to do to be saved. I know, but, but, but that's what I'm going to do. I can play you call after call, or people say, well, I know it's there. The, I have a call, I have a uh, clip of a lady that says, you know, I know Baptist is not in the Bible. I know Baptist is not in the Bible. Why are you in it? If you know the Baptist church is not in the Bible, why are you in it? See? If you know what the Bible says you must do to be saved, why don't you do it, friends? Why don't you do it? You come to our tent meetings, you know, we take your DVDs, we take your books. We maybe have a study with you, and then it's like, well, I, I don't want to do it. you got a heart problem, friends. Now, if you went to the doctor and he told you you got a heart problem, you need to have an emergency surgery. You need to have a triple, quadruple bypass. And you need to have stents and everything. I don't know what all uh, uh, the, the operations are, but everything, we need to do everything. Heart transplant in order to live. You'd probably do it. Friends, I'm saying you got a heart problem. If you're out there tonight and you haven't obeyed the gospel, friends, don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. Listen to what the Bible says. Accept what the Bible says. And let us help you be obedient to the Lord so that you'll be ready when the Lord comes back. We don't know when that's going to be, friends, but don't let it, don't let it be that you're lost because you hardened your heart. It all comes down to a problem of the heart. The heart of the problem is a problem of the heart. Friends, I'm out of time. If I can assist you or want to do that right thing, 276-340-2653. Till next time, thanks for watching. Always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night.